If his life had been so filled with excitement to the point of characterising him as a hero in a true adventure story, nothing was left of this figure of international intrigue, of the man searching for gold in Guyana, of the high society corrupter, of the most famous intelligence agent of our time, other than an old man plagued by illness, sinking into the mysticism of his past life. In this episode, we're heading into the world of spies and con artists, deceptions and double crosses, as we meet the enigmatic Baron Rudolf von Koenig. His is a story that will take us from the casinos of northern Spain, across to Vichy, France, and up to the small, nondescript town of Bletchley Park in southern England. Welcome to Ratbags and Roustabouts, the place where we tell those extraordinary stories of ordinary people who never made it to the history books. I'm your host, Marion Langford. Did all your ears prick up at the words Bletchley Park? Are you thinking, I've seen the imitation game, I know about the German Enigma Code, I've seen Benedict Cumberbatch playing Alan Turing, what more could there be to say? Well, stick around, because I bet you don't know about the guy I'll be talking about today. Actually, that's quite a bold statement. I certainly hadn't heard of him, but if by any chance you have heard of him before, drop me a line and you're welcome to gloat to your heart's content. Speaking of dropping me a line... Goodness, that was a smooth segue. If you want to tell me anything from letting me know what you think of the podcast to telling me your own amazing stories from your own family history, I would love to hear from you. You can either fill out the contact form on the website ratbagsandroustabouts.com or you can also follow the show's page over on Instagram. Anyway, let's get into today's story and head to Europe during the interwar period. It's mid-morning on the 1st of November 1931 and we are in Verviers, Belgium. By the way, I hope that my pronunciations in today's episode are okay. There's a lot of European names in here. Anyway, there's a biting chill in the air and there has been some light rain on and off for days. It's a Sunday and the train from Berlin has arrived two hours late. A man in his early 40s dressed in a dark coat and black hat is rushing from the station to the Grand Hotel on the Rue de Palais. As he enters the foyer, another man watches from behind a newspaper. He's 60, has grey thinning hair, wears dark-rimmed round glasses and carries a bit of extra weight around his belly that points perhaps to a fondness for rich food and French champagne. Within two hours, the two men would be meeting in room 31 of the hotel, one to offer secrets, the other to offer money. But it is when the younger man tells the older one the department where he works that the silver-haired spy pauses in amazement. He pours the younger man another whiskey as he flicks through the documents the man has brought to sell. Believe me, the younger man says, the reliability of our enigma is total, absolute, Your cryptologists will never manage to decrypt its messages unless they have help. The older agent, codenamed Rex, realises the importance of this contact, even if French intelligence hasn't quite grasped the luck in him coming forward. The men meet again a week later and then regularly for years as the German civil servant, who has somehow lucked into a job in the cryptology department, is secretly paid by the French for his top-level secrets. But it's the first secret he sells that is one of the most valuable, the manual for the German Enigma machine. The double agent's name was Hans Thilo Schmidt. He sold secrets because the salary the German government paid him wasn't enough to support his family. It was as simple as that. But this is not his story. This is the story of the other man in that hotel room, Agent Rex. Rex obviously means king, and king in German is Koenig, and that is how we have Rudolf Stolmann, later also known as Rudolf Lemoyne, 
son of a Berlin jeweller, living in France and England and Spain and frankly wherever the authorities aren't after him, styling himself as the Baron Rudolf von Koenig. Eight months after that first meeting between Schmidt and Koenig in July 1932, the German elections were held. The Nazi party became the biggest party in the Reichstag for the first time, though they failed to win a majority. In the campaign leading up to the election, Joseph Goebbels had given a speech titled The Storm is Coming, in which he said, Adolf Hitler is knocking at the gates of power. Hitler too gave a campaign speech in which he played on the problems caused by the Great Depression and called the German people to band together and fight for what he called a common destiny. They were early warning signs of what would come before the decade was out. But even then, before Hitler had become Chancellor, before the first concentration camp was built, before Jesse Owens was allegedly snubbed by Hitler at the Berlin Olympics, before the Night of the Long Knives and before Kristallnacht, Polish scientists were working from the document stamped Geheim, secret, that Schmidt had handed to Koenig over a glass of whiskey. The scientists were using the manual in an attempt to build their own Enigma machine. When war finally broke out, they passed their work over to the British, to that grand house in Bletchley Park, into the hands of genius mathematician Alan Turing. But Koenig's story starts decades earlier, even before the previous war in Berlin. I know Ratbags is meant to be focusing on ordinary people, but when you look at Koenig, he was anything but ordinary. He was born Friedrich Rudolf Stormann in 1871 in Potsdam, near Berlin. His father had been a wealthy jeweller, but he died in 1888 when Rudolf was 17. He had finished school the year before and went on to study languages, and at this point he was already committing petty crimes. He spent a week in prison when he was 18 for trespass and damage to property, and he began stealing to get money. During this time, he was also working in administration for an export business, and in 1890, he gets sent to Chile. He doesn't come back until he's turned 21 and therefore can get his inheritance that his father left him. It was about 150,000 Deutschmarks. He takes the money and begins travelling around with no apparent occupation, committing robberies, working as a con artist. He lives the high life in and around France and Belgium. He spends a month in prison in Munich for trying to run out on his hotel bill. He spends another three days in prison for using a false name. At one point, he seems to be posing as the husband of a prostitute and taking a share of her earnings. Essentially, he's a pimp. The pair of them begin taking adjoining rooms in grand hotels, watching the guests and breaking into the wealthy tourists' hotel rooms, taking what they like. They're operating mainly in the south of France and Koenig is gambling in Monte Carlo while stalking victims in hotels in Nice. They're also hanging out with some dubious customers. His friends are con artists and fraudsters, prostitutes and jewel thieves. There are frankly some bizarre stories attached to this part of Koenig's life. It's said he was seen spying for the Germans in France. It's rumoured he took part in a revolution in Argentina. That's something he actually did say himself in court. Another source says he joined the French Foreign Legion to avoid being arrested for robbery and murder before deserting. One thing is certain, though. He wasn't doing anything traditional or anything legal. In 1896, in Ostend, Belgium... He and a gang of three other men break into a large villa in broad daylight and steal 25,000 francs worth of jewels after some other accomplices had lured the woman who lived there into town. By 1898-99, aged around 28, he's built a nice little life for himself. He's playing cards in Monte Carlo, selling land in Argentina, working for an investment company in England, working with an oil company in Romania and he opens a series of casinos in Belgium. In fact, 
It's while he's working in London that he comes up with the new name for himself, Baron Rudolf von Koenig. He explains the decision to change his name by saying that he didn't want his family name to be connected to his gambling activities. And also, being known as a baron is useful because it means you can always get a reservation on a train. In October 1900, Koenig moves to Paris, but he hadn't been there long before Paris police receive an anonymous letter. It was from a Londoner who said Koenig was a German spy had been watching him in London and now had moved on to France. The helpful informant even included Koenig's forwarding address in Paris. Paris police begin watching Koenig as he flits here and there from a casino in Biarritz near the Spanish border to another in the Alps near the Swiss border, then another near Lyon, another in Interlaken in Switzerland. Clearly, the guy liked to gamble. Now, For any of you who know of the particularly English beef extract drink, Bovril, the son of John Lawson Johnston, the inventor of Bovril, who had just died at that point, well, his son happened to be staying in the south of France when he was recognised by one of Koenig's associates. They contrived to get the room next door and tried their very best to convince him to join them for for a late drinking session, clearly with the ultimate goal of robbing him. Luckily for the Englishman, he was tired and went to bed early, dodging disaster. Anyway, by March 1901, Koenig had also been noticed by the French National Police. They soon decide he's part of an international organisation of card sharps who steal from people across Europe, pawning the goods as they go. They decide that's enough to make him unwanted on French soil. They get paperwork together for an expulsion order. Then they have to actually wait for him to stop long enough so they can catch up to him to serve him with the papers. To the police, Koenig explains himself by telling them he's a professional gambler who bankrolls his lifestyle with a financial interest that he has in a gold mine in Transvaal, South Africa. And even right at the end, as the police commissioner is with him at the border with strict instructions not to let him out of his sight until he's safely out of France, Koenig is there trying to offer his services to spy for France in return for being allowed to stay. This drive to talk himself out of any sticky situation is a trait he will have throughout his entire life right to the end. He goes to Amsterdam then London, then America and Mexico, back to London. He's like a shark, he can't stay still, and he's always on the hunt for the next con, the next mark. He hustles, blackmails and steals. If you're picturing Michael Caine and Steve Martin here, I wouldn't blame you. It's definitely got the hallmarks of dirty, rotten scoundrels. We now find ourselves in London with a weird link between Koenig and Oscar Wilde, or thereabouts at least. Oscar Wilde was actually dead by this point, having passed away aged just 46 of meningitis. That was after he was released from prison, where he served a two-year sentence for gross indecency, basically simply because he was gay. Wilde had formed a group of men around him that included Lord Alfred Douglas, who he was in a relationship with, as well as a man called Maurice Schwabe. Douglas and Schwabe were also intimate with each other, something which possibly caused friction between Douglas and Wilde. Schwabe was mentioned at Wilde's trial, but his name was never said aloud. Instead, it was written on a piece of paper for those in the courtroom to read. Later, during Wilde's imprisonment, Douglas wrote an article in the playwright's defence, which in the end wasn't published until 2002. In it, he named Schwabe, saying, This youth was, in many respects, unwittingly responsible for Mr. Wilde's troubles. If Schwabe would have appeared in court, his testimony would have greatly strengthened Mr. Wilde's case. He did not come forward, and all efforts to trace him have been unsuccessful. Anyway, now in 1905, Douglas is married, Wilde is dead, and Schwabe has a new flatmate and a new hobby. Baron Rudolf von Koenig shares an apartment with him at Buckingham Gate in London and the pair of them seem to have an open door policy where anyone is able to pop round for a drink and a smoke. That's when they'll also pull out the card deck 
and suggest a hand or two. One night, a guest left with his wallet 500 pounds lighter and missing a pearl pin. And still the fellow went back. Koenig was charismatic in that way. There's a quote describing him. His sharp, lightly ironic wit, alert intelligence, apparent social status, cultivating self-deprecating manners and generosity make him a charming companion. The tall, handsome German always had money, always had alcohol, and always had an amusing anecdote. He treated everyone like his best friend and people naturally navigated to him, even if he had previously duped them. In the book, The Mysterious Mr. Schwabe, it tells this story. Koenig was so skilled at manipulation that once in The Hague, when he was accused of swindling a rich young American, the police who investigated were so impressed with the Baron that they asked the accusers to leave the hotel for causing trouble. At the end of 1905, Koenig sailed to Argentina. On the boat, he met a young French heiress, daughter of a Parisian doctor, Marie René Le Moyne. She was 17, he was 34. The pair married. They crossed the Andes together and happened to be in Valparaiso, Chile, on August the 16th, 1906, the day a massive earthquake struck, killing 3,800 people. Like so much of his life, Koenig escapes unscathed. Years later, Marie describes her marriage with him. Rudolph was a husband who took care of everything, explained nothing, only asked me to follow him. He gave me a sheltered existence. But in 1905, when news spread of Koenig's marriage, a former associate, the woman who used to be in on his con jobs in Monte Carlo, who he is supposed to have also forced into prostitution, sued him at that point for breach of contract, arguing that he promised to marry her. And this is where we see a flash of the nasty side of Koenig. He wrote to her at that time saying, How my wife and I laugh over you, knowing you have only water to drink. We are drinking champagne. Later he also wrote, You have brought it on yourself through your behaviour. If anyone stands in my way, then I tread on them. Around 1908, Koenig contacts the French police commissioner, who he offered his spying services to back when he was expelled from the country. He offers them again, sending an envelope of documents to do with German defence. French intelligence labels it without value, but they do decide to put Koenig on their books. Koenig and his wife continue to travel the world, their money coming from Koenig's usual dubious means. They go to South America, San Francisco, China, Indonesia, Holland, New York, Canada, While they're in India in 1911, extradition papers are served to send Koenig back to Berlin to answer charges of obtaining money by false pretenses. It takes a while for him to be found, but eventually he's arrested in London in 1912 and sent on to Germany. He's found guilty and sentenced to nine months in prison. This is how their ruse would go. Koenig and his accomplice would be playing cards. Koenig would then ask their victim how much he thinks he should bet on a hand. The victim would then be lured into playing with Koenig. The betting would increase and they would win some small hands but lose all the big ones. At the end of the evening it would be discovered that they owed a sizable sum. Koenig would start shouting, it's too much, I can't afford that, and he'd tear up the cards in a fit of anger. Cards that were dodgy, thereby stopping anyone from realising they had been duped. The victim would be told that as he was playing with Koenig, he has to pay half. The victim would start complaining that they weren't really playing, they were just helping Koenig. Eventually, Koenig would write a cheque for half the amount, pressuring the victim into doing the same. Of course, Koenig's cheque would never be cashed, and he and his accomplice would walk away with the victim's money. All this time, he's been doing the odd bit of work for French intelligence, and with World War I on the horizon, they send him to Spain to await further instructions. It suits him well. He settles his growing family. By 1914, he has two sons and the following year his daughter's born, in the town of Honderibia. 
It's right on the French border at the seaside and the whole coastline between San Sebastian and Biarritz is a magnet for the aristocracy, just Koenig's type. And with war, even more wealthy families had fled there to wait out the war in neutral Spain. Remember that casino Koenig opened in Brussels back at the turn of the century? Well, he still has it and has since added another casino in Santander, Spain, to his stock. That's just down the road from the place he now settles with his family. He buys another casino and spends his time enjoying the nightlife, getting up to his usual tricks, while also ferreting out the odd piece of information to give the French. There's a story that he and his wife caused a stir by walking down the street with a lover who they were both having relations with. I'm not sure if that's true. There's also talk that while he was working for the French, he was also working for the Germans. Again, hard to verify. But his gift of the gab and his deep self-confidence made him a valuable asset in the espionage game. There was a Spanish police commissioner who was selling information to the Germans. The French weren't happy and charged him. That's when Koenig went to the man and offered his services. If he told Koenig everything he knew about the German intelligence operations and promised to turn and begin working for the French, he'd save him from prison. The man happily agreed, Koenig told the powers that be, and French intelligence dropped the charges. Another time, a man who owned the canteen at the train station told Koenig that he'd helped a group of German POWs who'd escaped from a French camp. Koenig told the French Secret Service. Meanwhile, he invited the canteen owner out for a yacht ride. The man was then driven at gunpoint to waiting French authorities. He was judged, shot. Koenig pocketed a large prize for his part. During the war, the family moved to Barcelona where there were more secrets to be had, but Koenig never changed his ways or lifestyle. Then, by 1920, the Spanish wanted Koenig out, so the French lifted his old expulsion order and the family crossed the border once more. Between the wars, it was par for the course that every intelligence agency had a certain part of its employees made up of crooks and swindlers. That's how Koenig had begun for the French and now his espionage activities begin to take centre stage in his life. For someone with his background, his loose morals, as well as his charisma, ability to strike up conversation and steer it wherever he wanted to steer it, to manipulate and dominate, this work was well suited to him. He took his wife's name and stopped calling himself the Baron. Instead, he was Rudolf Lemoyne. But as a nod to his name of Koenig, his code name for the French was Agent Rex. With Germany becoming more important in the world of intelligence as war beckoned, he became a valuable asset for the French. He was good at finding people. A neighbour who worked at the German embassy, a grandmother who lived opposite the Russian embassy. He'd pay them a stipend and gather whatever information they came across. But as well as this, he did other work. He could procure a forged or even a legitimate passport for almost any country. He committed burglaries, he installed bugs in hotel rooms, and he ran contacts. Just like he did in 1931, when he was asked to see whether the information a German civil servant named Schmidt was of any value. Nobody knew yet that what the man had to offer would play a decisive role in a war that hadn't even begun. And so here we are, back at the start, back in that hotel room in Verviers, drinking whiskey and learning about ciphers. The Enigma machine was commercially available. When they were given the information from Schmidt, the Polish scientists already had a machine in their hands, but the Germans had made alterations to it. Plus, on top of that, there was no way to know the codes, and they changed daily. The Poles had already spent two years trying in vain to crack the German codes. The key to unlocking it arrived on November 8, 1931, the week after Koenig had first met Schmidt. It was the following Sunday, the train was late again, and Schmidt finally arrived at the same hotel in worn-out shoes and a coat that had seen better days. He handed over the documents and informed the French agents assembled that he had to leave by 3pm to make the train back to Berlin. 
they hurried up to one of the hotel rooms to photograph the stack of papers he'd provided, while Schmidt and Koenig stayed in the hotel's lobby, where price was discussed. Later, Paul Payol, Koenig's commander, wrote a book about the events. In it, there's a paragraph where he talks about the similarities between Koenig, referred to here as Agent Rex, and Schmidt. Was there a parallel between Rex's own destiny and that of the German he had recruited? Both were irrevocably linked to the cause of a country they had chosen, all while betraying their own. The extent of their commitment cemented their sincerity. Rex's brutality quickly laid bare the dramatic human aspects of our business. They paid Schmidt 10,000 marks for the bounty and after that the pair sat drinking whiskey, smoking cigars and chatting with ease while upstairs the other agents frantically photographed. They had in front of them a diagram of the German Enigma machine, a radio service code, instructions for manual coding, a short technical manual, a longer numbered manual and a numbered encryption manual. For good measure, he'd tossed in a report put together by the Defence Ministry on toxic gases that he'd got from his brother, who just happened to be a lieutenant colonel working in the ministry. Throughout these years, he would have no idea that his brother's interest in his work stemmed from a desire to sell the information to the enemy. The information handed to the French that day was a gold mine, but when Koenig and his bosses tried to shop the information around, they met brick walls. The French didn't want it, the British didn't want it. At that point, Hitler wasn't in power, so there was no imminent threat of Germany to those countries. The Polish, however, were on Germany's doorstep. They could smell the whiff of change in the air, and it was blowing decidedly in their direction. They jumped at the chance to use the documents and got to work. But it still wasn't enough for them to reconstruct the German machine. They didn't know what changes had been made to the internal wiring. They didn't know the daily rubrics or the specific keys used for each message. And then, each time they had a breakthrough, the Germans would change things again. Meanwhile, Schmidt was their secret weapon. He joined the Nazi party as part of his cover, foreseeing the part the Nazis would play. And soon he was friends with top-level party members, as he himself was offered high-ranking jobs. He knew Goering, and before the war was over, he would be at soirees with Hitler himself. And all the while, he was still meeting his French contacts, still passing over thousands of pages of secret documents with such casual ease. By the end of 1932, it's getting too dangerous for Schmidt to meet in Belgium, so Koenig begins to travel to Berlin. Schmidt hands over more information on Enigma, as well as proof of the rearmament of Germany's armed forces in contravention of the Treaty of Versailles. He then takes Koenig out on the town. They sit at his regular red velvet-clad booth in a cabaret as Schmidt drinks and schmoozes and makes dates with pretty girls for later. He's clearly enjoying his newfound money source. Koenig gives him a stern talking to. If he continues to live this way, he will get the wrong kind of attention. He promises to be more careful. In 1933, Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. Four weeks later, the Reichstag burns down. On April 1, the Nazis organise a national boycott of Jewish businesses. The evening before, Koenig meets Schmidt in Berlin. There's an ominous atmosphere over the city. Jewish shopkeepers have closed their curtains and locked their doors. Anti-Semitic graffiti is sprawled across shopfronts. Schmidt tells Koenig his latest intelligence, which he gleaned from his brother, who's now in charge of the Army Training Academy. Hitler doesn't trust anyone. He's forming a secret intelligence organisation called the Forschungsamt, an agency that will conduct all kinds of interceptions and wiretapping. Hitler's also forming a secret police called the Gestapo. Koenig relays the information back. As I understand it, with the Forschungsamt, The Nazis are going to eavesdrop, open letters and penetrate the secrets of the embassies. With the Gestapo and the concentration camps, all opposition will disappear. Meanwhile, during these years and with the help of Schmidt's smuggled documents, the Polish cryptographers had managed to recreate the German Enigma machine. But it was still taking too much time to decipher the German correspondence. 
In the lead up to war, Schmidt became one of the Allies' greatest assets. He told his French friends about Night of the Long Knives before it happened. He told them about Hitler's secret meeting in 1937 to prepare for war. He told them about wiretaps at the French embassy, about Hitler's plans for the Sudetenland. All this time, Koenig has continued to be Schmidt's main contact. But in 1938, that changes. Koenig is picked up by the Gestapo and held for eight days. He'd been trying to find new intelligence contacts in Germany and it had backfired. And with his background with the German police, he was soon in their sights. They can't risk Schmidt ever being connected with Koenig again. He's pulled off the case. Schmidt continues to give more and more valuable information to the French as he himself continues to rise through the Nazi ranks. War is declared, and to protect their years of work from the invading Germans, the Poles hand everything over to Bletchley Park. As we know, they succeeded in 1941, which went a great way towards winning the war. But when Paris is occupied by the Germans in 1940, Koenig is sent to Marseille and told to play dead. But finally, in June that year, the Germans cotton on to the fact that there is a high-ranking traitor in their midst. They have intercepted telegrams between embassies talking about things they couldn't possibly have knowledge of. The Germans remembered Koenig being picked up two years earlier. Soon they were hunting for him again. And now that they occupied Paris, they were finding all kinds of information that the French hadn't managed to destroy as the Germans marched up the Champs-Élysées. At the same time, they compiled a list of people who could have had access to the kinds of information that had been leaked in Germany. Schmidt's name is added to the pile. An officer throws his hands up in the air and says, really, one of the largest families of the Reich and one of the most valued leaders? Trust me, abandon that lead. As the Germans get closer to finding Koenig, he is told by French intelligence to move once more to Spain and then on to North Africa. But he stays in Spain and delays his trip on to Africa. The Germans have already looked in Marseille for him, but were too late. But now he's lured out of hiding, and in February 1943, he's arrested by the Germans. It takes him approximately half a second before he sells out Schmidt. Schmidt was arrested. For a long time, it was believed he was shot and killed by his captors. Later, it was rumoured he actually took his own life. The truth will never be known, but it's now thought that he may have been forced to swallow one of his own cyanide capsules. Koenig, though, he was fine. He simply began doing what he did best, spying, except now he was doing it for the Germans. He did, however, refuse to name his former colleagues. He did that much. The war ended, the Allies won. In October 1945, the French arrested Koenig and took him to Wildbad in the Black Forest. During his interrogation, he was a shadow of the man that he used to be. This is what one of his interrogators later said. If his life had been so filled with excitement to the point of characterising him as a hero in a true adventure story, nothing was left of this figure of international intrigue, of the man searching for gold in Guyana, of the high society corrupter, of the most famous intelligence agent of our time, other than an old man plagued with illness, sinking into the mysticism of his past life. His interrogation was unintelligible. In 1946, his old intelligence boss, Paul Payol, visited him. Koenig told him it was Schmidt's greed that was his downfall, absolving himself of any responsibility. When asked about the fact nothing had happened to him, that he had maintained his life of luxury at the expense of others after his arrest by the Germans, he said this, "'You will understand, my commander, Over my 30 years serving the Bureau, I paid off ministers, ambassadors, military officers, policemen, civil servants. 
is it so incomprehensible that there were in the Gestapo in 1943 and 1944 SS commissioners who were willing to share money in return for granting me favours that cost them nothing? A few days later, aged 75, he died of natural causes, with the world still completely unaware of the part he and Schmidt had played in the outcome of the war. And that's it, folks. The amazing, deceptive, charismatic, manipulative life of Rudolf Stormann, a.k.a. Baron Rudolf von Koenig, a.k.a. Rudolf Lemoyne. I'll leave you with this quote about him. It's from Payol's book, describing how Koenig was described to him ahead of their first meeting. You are going to encounter a curious character, de Robion had informed me. Espionage is as much in his nature as alcohol is to a drunkard. I'll be back as usual in a fortnight's time with the next episode of Ratbags and Roustabouts. Until then, you can follow on Instagram or check out the website for show notes to find out a bit more about me or to listen to previous episodes. You can also contact me with any ideas you have for future episodes. And on there, I've put a little extra nugget from today about Baron von Koenig, who we heard about, and his own ever so slight connection with my own ancestors. Let's just say, my family could have completely derailed the outcome of the war. Luckily, it was all okay in the end. So, I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe, and make sure you join me again for more stories about those commoners muck ratbags and roustabouts from our past who still have extraordinary tales to tell. (laughs) 